So we've had a lot of questions come up in regards to comparative statics. That is, how exactly do we work through this? Did it affect the supply? Did it affect the demand? I'm confused. Why is this a demand shift? Why did it go to the right? Why did it go to the left? So really what we're going to be working through in this video is we're just going to rehash. We're going to focus in specifically on these comparative statics. From here, we're going to work through a whole bunch of examples and hopefully set a good kind of framework for us to work out, for us to adapt, uh, adopt rather, in order for us to be able to work through this effectively. So let's go take a look. So to start off, right, we have our supply and our demand and we have our initial equilibrium. We're stationary. We're happy, right? We're in balance. We're in equilibrium. We will stay here forever until an outside shock acts upon us. Well, what we need to do then is we need to take a look at what exactly those determinants are, what exactly those possible shocks are that could influence our supply and our demand. And rather, we won't take a look at the actual shocks themselves, but we'll take a look at things that cause the supply and the demand curve to move. So let's start off by taking a look at our supply curve. So for our supply curve, seven, well, really six things. The seventh is just kind of an augmentation of it. We have, first of all, first and foremost, we have change in own price. And keep in mind what change in own price is saying is it's just giving us new read-offs between some price and some quantity supplied. Some price and some quantity supplied. So change in own price is only ever a movement along the supply curve. As we move down through the next five, the next five, right, we can kind of just go like this. These next five here, these are going to cause a shift of the supply curve. They're actually going to cause the supply curve to move to the left, move to the right. And then that final one there, Taxes and subsidies, that guy there is going to cause an augmentation of our supply curve. So that is our supply curve stays where it is. The marginal cost has not changed, but the way that the market views that supply curve has changed. That supply has shifted leftward. It has shifted rightward, depending on whether it was a tax or a subsidy, respectively. So as we're approaching this, as we read, okay, some shock has hit our market, one of the things that we first need to be taking a look at is we need to kind of be thinking through this and we need to be saying, okay, first of all, in the question, is there language that's kind of saying, hey, producers, the firm, the business, all kind of good hints that we're talking about supply in that case. On the other side, is there language being like, okay, consumer, demander, purchaser, well, okay, if that was the case, we'd be in demand, which we'll get to, right? Right now, let's focus on supply. So first kind of thing that you want to look for in language and the question itself. Second thing is you want to try to categorize the shock that is being described to you into one of these categories. It could be either one of these seven for supply or one into the subsequent six for our demand. So you need to kind of keep these in the back of your mind. It's not just like, oh, okay, those are determinants. Great, forget about them. No, 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 have these written out, right? Write them on your mirror, really get these into your head so you know what's happening so that you can very quickly go, oh, that's a change in the number of suppliers. That's a change in the cost of my inputs and be able to work through it in that way. Okay, what about the next one here? Demand. Well, okay, demand, same kind of idea, right? The first few determinants, they look very, very similar. Change in own price. Again, that's just a movement along the curve because just like we have with supply, changing on price is just saying, hey, here's a price, here's a quantity demanded. Here's a price, here's a quantity demanded. So just a read off along that same curve. These next ones here, these next five, all of these guys here, these are a change in the demand curve itself either causing the demand curve to shift to the left or shift to the right. Again, this initial shock is happening, Cetris Paribus. This shock happens with everything else in the world being constant. If we have a change in income, well, we have a change in our income, 
presuming that taste and preferences, population, expectation, other prices, and own prices are the same. Further, we're having a change in income given constant taxes, constant expectations, suppliers, technology, weather, change in costs. Everything else that could affect these curves is identical. The only thing that is impacted is this change in income. Okay, so first thing that we need to do, we need to identify based off of the shock listed, is this a supply shock? Is this a demand shock? One way to do it, one good helper, is to look at the language in the question. Are we referring to suppliers, producers, firms, businesses, or are we are we referring to the consumer, the purchaser, the demander, right? Depending on which one that you're referring to is going to give you a good kind of insight as to which kind of grouping you're going to go into. That language might not always be present though, right? If that language is not always present, you need to kind of go one step farther into it and you need to start looking at, okay, which determinant is being referred to and then work out based off of that, oh, change in income. Hey, change in income, that's my determinant of demand. This is going to impact my demand and work through things in this way, right? If it, we all of a sudden have a change in population, well, population is strictly listed here in our demand not in our supply, so that is going to influence our demand curve. So, okay, how we really want to be able to narrow these down into which one is being impacted. Then what we want to do is we want to actually apply the shock. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, we start at equilibrium, right? So here we have our initial price, our initial quantity, P0 and Q0. We're then going to have the shock hit. So we analyze what the shock is. We say, okay, this is going to be a supply shock or, okay, this is going to be a demand shock. So, okay, we figure out, boom, shock hits. We worked out the impact of that shock. We shift our curves appropriately. After we shift those curves appropriately, we recognize, hey, we have a disequilibrium. Do we have excess supply in disequilibrium? Do we have excess demand in disequilibrium? Where are we? Once we kind of figure out where we are in disequilibrium, we can figure out how we're going to adjust to our new equilibrium, right? And this is where a lot of people get, get stuck. They go, okay, shock hits, and they go cetris paribus, so they hit their shock, demand shifts to the right, and then we stop. Because, hey, cetris paribus, nothing else in the world is changing. Well, you're right, nothing else in the world is changing when that shock hit. But then that shock hit, it's been absorbed, it's now in disequilibrium, now the world starts to react to that shock. Now the world starts to change. Now we get back to our balance. We adjust to our new equilibrium, right? And as we adjust to our new equilibrium now, we're going to have changing prices. And those changing prices are now going to be for a new constant, all of our other determinants, right? So kind of want to think about this as we move through this is it's like walking. You always have one foot planted. First of all, shock hits. That's going to be one of our determinants moving. So, okay, shock hits, that's one foot moving through the air. That foot, boom, takes its plant, right? It's good. It's stable now. Now we begin our next one, which is going to be change in own price, which is that adjustment to our new equilibrium, right? Only ever one foot moving at a time, only ever one thing at a time happening. So, We'll work through a whole bunch of questions, a whole bunch of examples to work through this. Let's just, in this case here where we have this, let's take a look at a quick scenario. Well, let's take a look at the market for housing. So this is going to be the market for, well, wrong tool. Market for real estate. And we'll say this is the market for real estate in Victoria. And we'll say that suddenly, Suddenly, we have had something like an inflow of 30,000 people into the Greater Victoria region, so into the CRD, the Capital Regional District. So, okay, for context, Capital Regional District has a population of about 300,000. So 30,000 people all of a sudden moving into the CRD. That's like a 10% increase in our population, right? It's, it's pretty drastic. So, okay, all of a sudden, 30,000 people have moved into Victoria. What is this impacting? Well, let's go through and think about this. I'm just going to jump back so we can see all of our determinants. 
So 30,000 people. Well, that's not a change in on price, right? I'm not saying all of a sudden the price changed. We're not saying the price changed in anything else. So, okay, right, we're just working through this list. We're saying, does this make sense? So, so far, no, that doesn't make sense. No, changing cost of inputs. We didn't say anything got more expensive. We didn't say anything like that. So, no, technology or weather. Nah, we didn't really make any reference to that. Suppliers. Do we say we have more people making houses or anything along those lines? Right, we're talking about the housing market, so suppliers of houses. We didn't say we had a surge in development or new developers, so no. Did we talk about future expectations, like, hey, in the real estate market, we expect this to happen? No. And we didn't say anything about taxes or subsidies, so no. Right, so in this way here, we just worked through this, and we've just eliminated supply. We've said, okay, this cannot be a supply shock. So let's go down into our demand. Change in own price. Well, again, we didn't talk about prices at all, so no. Change in price of other goods. Again, didn't talk about prices, so no. Let's get rid of this little income one here. Um, there we go. Change in income. Again, we didn't talk about any changes there, so no. Say some preferences. Yeah, we didn't say... Hey, Victoria is a beautiful place and lots of people all of a sudden realize they want to live there. So, no. Population. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. What did we say happened? We had an increase of 30,000 people into Victoria. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like population to me. And to finish it off, expectations. Yeah, no, we didn't really have any change in expectations. We didn't say anything about what we expect in the future. Like, hey, consumers expect this to happen. So, no. Right, so in this way here, we've been able to isolate our one determinant, right? The one determinant that's impacting, in this case, our demand curve. From this, we can now work through what impact this is going to have. So let's go, let's go take a look at what it ends up doing. Okay, so we said these, this plus 30,000 people moving into Victoria. We said, okay, that was affecting that determinant of demand, which was population. If we recall back, right, technically this is all underlying. This is why we went through consumer theory before we went through the market. This is why we went through producer theory before we went through the market. Because that demand curve is underlying in consumer theory. That supply curve is underlying in producer theory. And we saw back in consumer theory, way back, as to how we got this demand curve, right? We took everybody's individual demand curve. We added them all up horizontally, and we saw, hey, if I add up more people, my demand is farther to the right. If I add up fewer people, well, my demand curve is not going to be as far out. It's going to be more to the left. So in this sense here, what we can work out is, okay, I've just had a hit to my demand, which is going to cause this guy here to shift out to the right. So just dragging that guy there out to the right. Right, often we would want to redraw it, but in this case here, I really want to emphasize that by this demand curve shifting, that old demand curve has disappeared, right? We now just have our new reality with our new demand curve, and I just don't even want to recognize that old demand curve. And I really want to do that because I find that people at times get confused when there's the two demand curves, two supply curves floating around. Right? In reality, boom, as soon as we've had a shock, that old one ceases to exist. As a result of that, okay, what have we done? We've started at equilibrium. Our shock has hit. Boom, that's our shock. We've worked out the impact of our shock. That was our demand curve shifting to the right. Okay, four, evaluate our disequilibrium state. So, okay, evaluating our disequilibrium state, what used to be our Q0, our initial equilibrium, that is now my quantity supplied at this given price, right? Price to supply curve down, giving me my new quantity supplied. At the same time, boom, we've got a surge in demand, right? It's not like, oh, wow, we're expecting a ton of people to move to Victoria. We're going to boost prices. No, 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 no. This is a ton of people move to Victoria. They're looking at real estate and they're saying, yeah, yeah. Given that we've moved here, we now want to buy this many houses. So, oh, we have this discrepancy now, right? We have this excess demand occurring. Keep in mind, the quantity exchanged is the lesser of the two. 
So we're only buying and selling quantity supplied, but people want to buy quantity demand in order to actually get a house when there's not enough for everybody. Well, the people who want houses, they begin to bid up the price. As they begin to bid up the price, well, some people begin to fall off the market. They say, yeah, I wanted it at P0, but at this new higher price, no thanks. I don't want to buy a house anymore. I'm going to hold off. Same thing on the supply side. They were only willing to make, only able to offer so many houses for sale at P0. But hey, as people begin to bid up the price, as they begin to say, hey, I'll pay more and more and more for a house. Well, our suppliers, our developers are going to start to say, yeah, okay, we'll start to offer more and more and more for sale. And in that way there, we work up to our new equilibrium. And where do we end up in the end? We end up at a new quantity exchanged. Here, let me use a new color for this, just to really make this bold that this is brand new. There's my new quantity exchanged. There's my new price. So we'll call the new price. P1, we'll call our new quantity exchanged Q1. And what we then want to evaluate is what exactly has happened here. So, okay, as we've adjusted to our new equilibrium, the shock has hit, disequilibrium adjusted to a new one, we have witnessed the price rising. At the same time, with respect to our initial quantity, we've witnessed that the quantity exchanged has risen right from q0 to q1 so we've witnessed all together boom shock hit demand curve shifted to the right that caused a disequilibrium scenario with us having excess demand because we've had excess demand we have then had to change in own price and move along each of our curves back to our new equilibrium so in that case there, as we moved along each curve, change in own price, well, that change in own price was now for our new fixed population, that plus 30,000, right? And we're now holding that fixed as we change our price. One step at a time. 30,000 new people, fixed, boom, here's our new population. We have a disequilibrium. Price has changed. That's our next step forward, our next foot moving, adjusting us back to equilibrium. So our two steps. Okay, so quick example working through that. I have about probably 10 examples that I hope to work through through the rest of this video. So we'll go through them. I'll give you a few seconds to read through it. Try hopefully figure it out on your own first and then I will work it through as well. So let's go take a look at those. Okay, this guy here. With respect, well, okay, before I read it, because I'll end up emphasizing big parts just naturally as I read it, take a quick look at this, read through it, see what you got, try to work through it, pause it, because I'm just going to jump right into it. Okay, with respect to the production of wood chips, a complement to lumber production, the price of lumber suddenly increases. Okay, so a lot going on here. First thing, right, what is really popping out to me is production of wood chips. A complement. Production. So, okay, all of this to me is screaming supply. We're talking about supply. Okay, the next thing that we need to kind of think about is we have two goods going on here. We have wood chips and lumber. Right, we're saying, okay, sure, the price of lumber suddenly increases, but are we interested in the market for lumber? Well, no, 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 we're interested in with respect to the production of wood chips. So, okay, first thing, first thing we should always want to do is draw our supply, draw our demand, draw our market. So let's do that. Just kind of pop it in here. We're going to have our initial market in equilibrium, there we have it. Let's, let's move everything up a bit. Okay, so in this case here, we have our market, and it's always helpful to kind of say what market we're referring to. And in this case here, with respect to the production of wood chips, so we are referring to the market for wood chips. Okay, so that's what we're analyzing. Boom, we're starting in initial equilibrium. Great, we have that. 
Now our shock. Uh, complement to lumber production. Okay, so wood chips and lumber are complements and the price of lumber suddenly increases. So, okay, let's write that down. Price of lumber goes up. Okay, this is where we really need to focus in. Are we talking about supply or are we talking about demand? Again, production, production, production. We're talking about supply. So as the production of lumber goes up, Law of supply, our quantity supplied of lumber goes up, right? These two go in conjunction. Okay, back to our wood chips market. Nothing's happening here. So, right, Cetris Paribus, price of wood chips is fixed. There's no change. No change. This guy's constant at P0. So, P0 wood chips. But... What we see, what we've read here, is that wood chips and lumber are complements. Meaning as I make more lumber, every time I rip a sheet of lumber, I just get wood chips falling off. So just simply by the act of creating more lumber, I'm also creating more wood chips. So in this case here, more lumber, more wood chips, right? Just simply by creating lumber. So Okay, how, what, what does this mean? Well, this means now that my supply curve, I used to be at P0, having a quantity supplied right at equilibrium, but we see that now my quantity supplied has increased, right? That is, all of a sudden my quantity supplied is something like out here, right? We could go, boom, that's my new, quantity supplied of wood chips. I'll go QS prime because also I'm producing more lumber. So by default, I'm producing more wood chips. So, okay, what does that mean? It means that this supply curve is shifting to the right and passing through that new point. And let's see if I can move that S over as well, just to match, right? And again, purposely, shifting that demand curve, causing it to move, not drawing a new one, just so that we can kind of really visualize that that old supply curve has technically ceased to exist. Okay, so we've had a shock, Cetris Paribus, we've now found ourselves in a disequilibrium situation. Specifically, a disequilibrium situation such that what used to be my quantity exchanged is now strictly just my quantity demanded. Right, price to my demand curve and down. So in this case here, I find that I have excess supply. I'm producing much, much more wood chips than the market is willing to buy at the given price. So, okay, what am I gonna do with all these wood chips? Right, I wanna get something for them. So as a producer, I begin to lower the price. So given that we have a disequilibrium, we've applied our shock. Boom, that foot is down, it's planted. We have a disequilibrium, we have excess supply. Next foot moves through the air, which is that adjustment, that change to our new equilibrium, that change in price to adjust to our new equilibrium. So what's happening here? Our producers, they want to start liquidating their excess stock, so they begin to push down the price. As they begin to push down the price, well, our consumers say, okay, at a lower price, I'll buy more. So... As we go through that, we move along each of our curves. We move along our demand curve, we move along our supply curve, and we arrive at a new price and a new quantity. So I'll call that Q1. That's my new quantity exchanged, such that at price one, we have quantity supplied and quantity demanded being one and the same. So overall effect, with respect to initial equilibrium, my price of wood chips has fallen. With respect to initial equilibrium, my quantity exchanged has risen. So the working out of this comparative static for a change in the price of a complement of production. Of course, right, we could work through this in the complete opposite way. If you flip this around, if we said, hey, the price of lumber fell, flip all those arrows around, everything would be going in the opposite direction and we would get the same result 
completely symmetric, just in the opposite direction. Price would have risen, quantity exchange would have fallen. Okay, so again, another question here. You quickly have a read for it before I start going through it because I'll start to emphasize words. See if you can work through what exactly is happening, what this means. Identify the determinant, identify the curve that's moving, and then begin to work through it. A big hint is always write down your determinants, draw your curves, visualize what's happening. Okay, so what do we have? It is estimated that the income elasticity for McDonald's food is, and, or eta y, so income elasticity, negative 1.46. I'm, I'm just going to write that down. Uh, eta y is negative 1.46. Okay. If we were to suddenly enter a recession such that household incomes began to fall, so okay, I have a recession, my incomes go down. Uh, with respect to the market for McDonald's food, we should witness what? Okay, so a lot going on there. Really, this is a throwback to our different uh, sensitivities of demand, specifically the income elasticity of demand. And I'm just saying, hey, we have an income elasticity of negative 1.46. What, what does that mean? Well, negative 1.46, let's see how that's possible. Income elasticity, percent change in my quantity demanded for a percent change in my income. So, okay, don't worry about the magnitude. The magnitude is actually not important. What we need to focus on is this sign and focus on, okay, how exactly is it possible to get a negative sign? Well, the one way we can do this is we can kind of hone in on the fact that, hey, we already have this known that y is decreasing. That is, y is negative. So, hey, how, how is that possible? Well, we know how it's possible. Income fell. But that is, we have a negative percent change in income. We want our final value here to be negative. So what does that mean happen to our quantity demanded? Well, that means our quantity demanded must have been a positive, right? Positive divided by a negative would give us a negative. That means by having a negative sign here, this means that McDonald's is an inferior good. And now we have everything we need in order to be able to work through this. So let's take a look at our market and let's go from there. Okay, so there's our market, supply, demand. We have our initial equilibrium. And again, what market are we talking about? We're talking about the market for McDonald's. Right, in this case, we only have the one good going on. We just have McDonald's food. So, okay, it's not as important, but good habit to get into just so that we can keep ourselves on track as to what we're doing. Our shock, well, our shock is that our incomes have fallen. The bit of information that's important with this is that McDonald's is an inferior good. And in fact, we've now already worked through what the outcome of this shock is, right? We said, hey, Incomes negative, percent change in quantity demanded, positive. So, hey, positive quantity demanded. Income, that was a determinant of demand. Elasticity of income, that's a demand elasticity. Everything with this is screaming demand shift. So, okay, boom. We now find we have a new quantity demanded right out here. So if that's my new quantity demanded, what does that mean? It means that this demand curve has shifted to the right and we have oh, a little bit farther, there we go. And we have our new disequilibrium at P naught. So boom, we've applied our shock. We now have a state of disequilibrium. We now need to work out what's happened. So okay, that's my new quantity demanded. What used to be my quantity exchanged is now just my quantity supplied, price to supply, quantity supplied. We say, okay, given this drop in income, 
McDonald's being inferior, good. We're going to begin to consume more McDonald's, so... Uh-oh, there's not enough. So we begin to pay more in order to get those Big Macs. So as we pay more to be able to get those Big Macs, we begin to push up the price. McDonald's responds. They begin to produce more Big Macs, but it costs them more to produce that extra unit, so they charge a higher price for that extra unit. This all equalizes, right? This all balances out. Then we get a new market price. We get a new quantity exchanged. So new P1, new Q1, such that what has happened as a result of this? We witness that prices have risen and quantity exchanged has risen. So price up, quantity up, given this positive demand shock. Let's keep going. Let's take a look at the next guy here. So, okay, with respect to the market for Halloween, or sorry, with respect to the market for Halloween, with respect to the market for candy, Halloween is now over. Okay, this is a bit more of a difficult one just because it's really not mentioning anything about supply or demand in there. You really have to think about what's happening in this case here. So I'll give you a second to think about that. Pause, and then we'll carry on. Okay, so in this case here, we really have to go back and thinking about our determinants of supply, our determinants of demand, and even back to our consumer and our producer theory. So starting off with the supply curve, Halloween's over, and what a lot of people end up thinking with this is they go, oh yeah, 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 Halloween's over, so hey, we don't need to produce as much candy anymore, our quantity supply fell. Okay, I'm not going to argue with that, but... That's not the rationale. If you go back to our determinants, if you go back to our producer theory, why would our quantity supply fell? fall, right? What is going on in order to influence that? So we'll hold on to that, but that's not our shock, right? That's not what is being impacted here. Candy, Halloween is now over. Out of all of our determinants, this is likely going to be impacting our tastes and preferences. So now that Halloween's over, right, pre-Halloween, we were had this preference to buy candy. We were buying candy to throw at kids as they came to our door to keep them away. But now, now that Halloween's over, we don't need to do that anymore. So we don't need to be buying candy anymore, meaning my preference, my tastes for buying candy has dropped. So in that case there, what does that mean? I've had a change in my taste and preferences downwards. I don't need to buy as much candy as I do anymore. Well, if that preference has dropped, if that taste, if it's not there anymore, that means my quantity demanded is lower. So that is all of a sudden, all else equal, same price of candy. I just don't need to buy as much as I once did. So I now have my new quantity demanded of candy. Again, how do we work through that? That means that this demand curve here was shifting to the left. Let's just erase that bit that pops up over there. There we go. So my demand curve has shifted to the left. That is what used to be my quantity exchanged is now just my quantity supply. Okay, so change in tastes and preferences has meant that I have lower demand for candy, causing my demand to shift to the left giving me this disequilibrium situation where I now have excess supply of candy being produced. Well, okay, given this excess supply, people don't wanna buy the candy, so okay, we start to sell it for less. So as we start to sell our candy for less in order to liquidate it, we move down along our supply curve. Hey, that demand for candy picks up a little bit at the lower price, and we end up at a new equilibrium. At this new equilibrium, we have our new quantity exchanged, we have our new price. So new price, P1, price of candy altogether has fallen as a result, and new equilibrium, Q1, such that my quantity altogether has fallen as well. So there we have it. Okay, now let's go back to this. Right, you had in this mind, hey, Halloween's over, we don't need to be producing as much candy, so our quantity supply has fallen. Well, is this true? Did we witness this? Yes, we did, right? We did witness that, so you weren't wrong in thinking this, but the reason why our quantity supply fell, 
fell is because the price began to fall. The reason the price began to fall was because the consumers didn't want to buy as much anymore. Right. And yes, in reality, this works very smoothly. Right. This would be a seasonality kind of change. Both producers and consumers know that this adjusts really, really rapidly. But we witness, right, P1, at P1 over to our supply curve, we would have our new quantity supplied prime such that, yeah, our quantity supplied did fall because of the fall in price. The fall in price was given the fall in demand. So bit of a tricky one. You really have to go back to your determinants there and kind of analyze which one is being impacted. So bit bit tougher in that case there. With respect to the production of automobiles, the United Automobiles Workers, um, it's a union, the uh, UAW, they successfully negotiate a 4% pay raise. Okay, see if you can work that guy out. Pause. We'll come and take a look at it together. Okay, so in this case here, we are looking at the market for automobiles. And on top of that, we're looking for the market for automobiles. And I know that because I'm saying, hey, with respect to the production of automobiles, and I really want to highlight this word here, production, right? So that gives me a really, really strong hint that I am dealing with a supply situation. I'm focusing in on my supply side. Okay. So production of automobiles, I got my market for automobiles, and then all of a sudden, the union that produces these vehicles, they negotiate a 4% pay raise. Okay, so what does that impact? Going through our determinants, right? Determinants of supply, determinants of demand. On the supply side, 4% pay raise. This is an increase in our cost of inputs. Right, it now costs more in labor to produce the same car that it, we used to be able to produce before. So, hey, given that I have this increase in the cost of my inputs, increase in the cost of labor, all else constant, still price of P0, so all else constant, I'm not going to be able to produce as many cars as I once was able to. So, because of that, my supply is going to decrease and I'm going to have, right, I'm not going to be able to produce as much cars as I once was. I'm going to have my new quantity supplied right there because of this raise, this pay raise. Okay, what does that do? That causes my supply curve to shift to the left. As that supply curve shifts to the left, I get this disequilibrium situation. Again, what used to be my quantity exchanged is now just my quantity demanded, price to demand and down, and I find myself in a case of excess demand. So, okay, these people ask for a pay raise. I can't produce as many cars given this higher cost. It's just too, it costs me too much to be able to sell at this price. But given that, I drop my production too much with respect to the demand for vehicles. So we begin to bid each other up for access to get these vehicles. So demanders push up the price. Producers respond by increasing their price and increasing their production. We wind up back at equilibrium. Back at equilibrium, we get our new market price. We get our new quantity exchanged such that we are now at P1 and Q1. What has happened with relation to equilibrium? Initial equilibrium. Well, this has caused the price of vehicles to rise and the quantity exchanged to fall. Right? Q0 to Q1, P0 to P1. So because of this increase altogether of wages, yes, we decrease our production, but we didn't decrease it all the way to quantity supplied. It does rebound a little bit back up to Q1 given the increase in prices. So altogether with relation from equilibrium to equilibrium, prices up, quantities down. Let's carry on. Let's take a look at some more. Take a look at this guy. This guy's a tougher one because we haven't actually looked at an example of a subsidy yet. 
see if you can work through it, go back to your determinants of each one, pause it, and then we'll take a look at it together. Okay, so with respect to the market for post-secondary education, the government decides to provide a $100 per course subsidy. What? What? This supplies, this demand, you're like, hey, okay, if all of a sudden they're subsidizing education, maybe people want to go to more courses. If people want to go to more courses, right? And again, I'm just going through the way that I typically see this question answered. People want to go through more courses. Well, we're going to have an increase in our quantity demanded for courses. Well, okay, yes, but what's the function? Why? Why does that happen, right? If you go back to our determinants of demand, what is happening to make that so? That's where it becomes really hard to answer that, right? So maybe, maybe this will happen, but how? How will that happen? So going back to our determinants, the government decides to provide a $100 per course subsidy, right? That's our keyword, subsidy. If we go back to our determinants of supply or demand, we realize that taxes and subsidies were a determinant of supply, such that they didn't shift the supply curve. This was a case where they augmented the supply curve. Taxes, taxes augmented the supply curve to the left. Subsidies, subsidies augment to the right. So in this case here, we would augment our supply curve this way. This would be my supply minus my subsidy, such that just like in our tax world, if we were to go take a look at this, if I were to measure this vertical distance between the two lines, that vertical distance there would be the size of my subsidy, that is $100, right? I'm doing $100 per course, so that vertical distance would be that $100. Okay, how does this work out? Well, okay, even though this is an augmentation, this old supply line, we can almost just forget about it while working out our equilibrium, right? We can just kind of say, okay, let's forget about it. Yes, this is the marginal cost of the firm, of post-secondary institutions. This is their minimum willingness to accept but it's not what the market sees anymore. The market now sees this. So based off of that, and based off of the fact that that's happening, what we end up witnessing is that we would be willing to supply all the way out here as a post-secondary institution, right? We'd be saying, okay, wow, we're getting that much of a subsidy at this current price of education, boom, all the way out there, that's how much we would be willing to supply. Because hey, vertical distance up, we'd be actually getting this much, right? So hey, it looks pretty good. Okay, but that's, that's the issue, right? Back here at the initial equilibrium, this old supply curve is essentially gone. So blue line down, blue line down is our quantity demanded. We find that we have this excess supply. So boom, the subsidy gets put into place. We think, great, we can produce all of this. No, that's not exactly gonna happen. We are offering too many courses. Price per course begins to drop. As that price per course begins to drop, so does that quantity supplied. Hey, at this lower price of a course, the demanders, the students, are willing to take more and more courses, and we end up at a new equilibrium that is much lower. In this case here, we end up with our new quantity exchanged, our new price. So there's my P1, such that my price has fallen, given this subsidy. And the amount of courses altogether registered for Q1, that has risen. So lower price altogether, higher quantity exchanged. Keep in mind, right, just like with our tax situation, how far this guy falls is not going to be the full subsidy. Vertical distance between the two curves is my subsidy. And so we see that, hey, in that sense there, that was our full $100. The price doesn't drop a full 100 Part of this subsidy is shared between the producer. Some of it is shared by the consumer.
Same as with a tax, where part of that tax burden falls on the consumer, part of that tax burden falls on the producer. So ultimately, subsidy is put into place, price falls, quantity up. Opposite case is our tax. Another one. Right? Like I said, we have a bunch of these that we're going to work through. So with respect to the consumption of cream, a complement to coffee, the price of coffee suddenly increases. Okay, I emphasized words as I went through that, but really pause it, see what you can do. We'll pick this up together in a second. Okay, so let's take a look at our curves. And we have, reading through this, right, big keywords that pop up to me with respect to the consumption of cream. So, okay, I'm talking here about cream, and I really want to focus in on the consumption side. So, okay, the consumption side, that's my demand curve, right? I'm really focusing in on demand. Further... We are saying with respect to the consumption of cream, which is a complement to coffee. So, okay, I have complements going on here. And then I find out that the price of coffee suddenly has risen. So price of coffee, I'm going to do C, let's go CF for coffee. Price of coffee has gone up. Okay. Price of coffee has gone up. I know I'm talking about consumption, so I'm talking about demand. So my law of demand. Price of coffee up, quantity demanded of coffee must be down, right? Law of demand, how do I know I'm demand? Consumption, so okay, based off of that, price of coffee up, quantity demanded of coffee down. This is happening in Cetris Paribus. This is happening over in the market for coffee, right? Something has happened over there that's caused this. In my market, Cream, price of cream, uh, we'll go CRM for cream. Price of cream is constant. There's nothing changing there. But yet, despite that fact that there's no change in the price of cream, these guys are complements. We buy them together. If I'm buying less coffee, well, if without coffee, I have less need for cream. So my quantity demanded for cream falls. Well, okay, if my quantity demanded for cream falls, I used to have right there at equilibrium, quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. I'm now going to find myself somewhere over here. There we go. That's my new quantity demanded. Well, okay, clearly not on my curve. My demand curve then must have shifted to the left. As such, again, we'll just erase this tail that pops out. And I find myself in this disequilibrium. So I've applied my shock. I recognize I'm in a disequilibrium. The one foot has moved. Now I need to reevaluate. So reevaluate. I have my quantity demanded at this current price. Price to supply. What used to be my equilibrium is now just my quantity supplied. Excess supply. Excess supply of cream means we begin to liquidate our cream to be able to sell it before it starts to go bad. At this lower price, we go, okay, well, maybe I actually have reason to buy cream for other things. So my quantity demanded for cream begins to rise, and I begin to witness a new equilibrium forming. At this new point, P1, Q1. And we have our new equilibrium. The result of this, well, shift in our demand curve to the left. That shift in our demand curve to the left has caused my price to fall and my quantity to fall. And I have my new equilibrium. Carrying on. Take a look at this one. See if you can work out this guy here. Okay, so with respect to the market for personal computers, consumers develop a new preference towards the mobility offered by laptops, right? So, okay, emphasizing keywords there. First, first keyword, consumer develops. Okay, so consumer, this is demand. I'm really thinking about my determinants of demand. They develop a new preference 
towards the mobility offered by laptops. So, okay, I'm getting at tastes and preferences. What market am I referring to? Because, hey, I've got personal computers and laptops being discussed here with respect to the market for personal computers. So that is, I am talking about personal computers in this case here. Okay, so, okay, all of a sudden I want more laptops. Oh, what, what, what do we think is going on here? Are laptops and personal computers, are these guys things that are complements or are these that are things that are substitutes, right? It doesn't explicitly say, nor do I say there's a change in price. Really, this is just a change in preference, but what do you what do you think? Do you think if you're buying more laptops, you're just going to also buy more computers as well? Or is a laptop something you buy instead of a computer? Well, really, they both do the same thing, right? They both run on Chrome or iOS or Windows, depending on which kind you have. If you have that desktop personal computer, great, it's stuck at the desk. If you have a laptop, does the same thing, maybe not quite as powerful, but you have the mobility that comes with it. We're saying that, hey, we have a preference towards mobility. So if you have a preference towards mobility, well, hey, I'm thinking, I take that to mean that my quantity demanded for laptops is going up. If I want more laptops, well, what does that mean for personal computers? Right? Keep in mind, right, the big thing that's always, always forgotten, fundamental assumption of economics. We live in a world of scarcity. So, hey, if I'm getting more laptops, I have to give something else up. And if I'm giving something else up, close substitute is going to be this personal computer. That is, I'm going to be buying laptops instead of personal computers. Through these preferences, I no longer have a preference for personal computers. My preference for personal computers falls. I have my new quantity demanded. In this case here, that really is not a curve. So my demand curve has shifted to get there. And again, if I just erase this tail that pops out past my axes, we find that we have another disequilibrium situation. My initial price is now just my quantity, or my initial equilibrium quantity exchange is now just my quantity supplied at that initial price. And I've now applied my shock. I recognize I'm in a disequilibrium, recognize I'm in a disequilibrium with excess supply. So, hey, in order to sell these all these extra personal computers, what do we have to do? We have to begin to lower the price. As we lower the price, our quantity demanded for personal computers begins to rise again. And we wind up at a new equilibrium, and we find that new lower price, new lower quantity exchanged. Price fell, quantity exchanged fell. And we can work through that scenario. Hopefully we're getting really the hang of this by now. Let's go through a few more. Just really, really drive this home. Carrying on, right? Promised you, we have a lot of these. Really, really good to have a lot of examples really drive this off. With respect, what do we have going on here? We have the labor market. So, okay. This here is the labor market. This is inherently tricky just because we're talking about the labor market. And the reason why it's inherently tricky is because it flips the suppliers and the demanders around. You typically view yourself as a demander of goods and services. In the labor market, though, you are a supplier of labor. The firm, right, the businesses, they are the demander of labor. So our traditional kind of view of thinking about this is you as a demander, the firm as a supplier, has switched. So it just makes it trickier because you have to do a bit of uh, mental gymnastics to get through that. Okay, in this case here then, you are now the firm, you are now the supplier of labor, the cost of childcare drastically decreases. So maybe for most of you, you're like, well, okay, what's the big deal with that? But okay, the cost of childcare for many households this is a cost of supplying their labor, right? If the cost of childcare is too high, they're not going to supply their labor to the labor market. It's just not worth the wage that they get. But if the cost of childcare is lower, well, hey, that's a 
input, cost of an input into order for them to be able to supply labor, cheaper input, they're going to be willing to supply their labor now. So, okay, as we just went through that, what was that? At this price, cost of child care falls. That's a decrease into my inputs. Decrease in the cost of my inputs means that I can now increase my quantity supplied, all else constant. There's my new quantity supplied. That is, the supply curve has gone to the right. It has increased. As that supply curve has increased and gone to the right, well, I find myself in disequilibrium. What used to be my quantity exchanged, that is now price to demand. That's just now my quantity demanded. So I have a case of excess supply. Excess supply, we begin to push down the price which we're offering our labor for because hey, there's so much excess supply, there's not enough jobs for us. We're saying, hey, you know what? Sure, given this cheap cost of childcare, I'd work for slightly less if that meant I could make money. So okay, this wage begins to fall a little bit. As that wage begins to fall, firms say, hey, hey, if wages are cheaper, sure, we'll hire more people. So quantity demanded for labor begins to increase. This all goes in conjunction until we arrive at the new equilibrium. And at the new equilibrium, what do we arrive at? We have a new lower price, P0 falling to P1, and our quantity exchanged, our quantity exchanged rises from Q0 to Q1. So we have more people working for a slightly lower wage. We have more employment overall. So one way we can work through that. Last one. Last one, here we go. Let you work through that one. See if you can get it. Otherwise, we'll get at it in a second here. Okay, so with respect to the market for cigarettes, the government places an additional $10 per carton tax. So, okay, again, we are talking about the market for cigarettes. And we're going to need to work through determinants of supply, determinants of demand, which one is being impacted here. Well, okay, as we go through that, big key word here, tax. If we recall, taxes is an augmentation of our supply curve. That is, taxes augment our supply curve to the left. So if we work through that guy, supply curve shifting to the left rather augmenting to the left, right? In this case, I'm keeping the original one there. We have our supply plus our tax. That's because the firm's willingness to accept their marginal cost is staying the same. But what we're seeing in society now is this new increase. So, hey, at this price, uh, we're not really wanting to do as much as we used to because, boom, we'd be down there. But we end up in this discrepancy. I'd say, yeah, I'm only really wanting to produce this quantity supplied given this tax on my good because I'm not receiving as much anymore. Because I'm not receiving as much anymore, well, quantity demanded, that's still going to be based off the original price. We have this excess demand altogether for cigarettes. As a result, demanders begin to push up the price. Suppliers begin to match. And we work to our new equilibrium, price, sorry, quantity, price. And we find that our price of cigarettes rises with respect to the initial equilibrium, while our quantity exchanged falls. Okay, so there we just worked through a whole bunch of comparative statics. Hopefully we saw that through all of these cases here, we more or less followed these kind of steps. We started off in an equilibrium. We applied our shock. We worked out what the impact of that was. We recognized we were in a disequilibrium state. We then began to adjust to a new equilibrium. Big recommendation as you go through this. First of all, have your determinants of supply and demand written out next to you. Second, don't try to visualize this in your head. You'll get it confused. You'll get it backwards. Quickly draw out a supply and demand diagram. Draw out the market. 
work through the shock. By visually working through it, you can think through the process a lot easier. What were our determinants again? There you go. Finishing off, we have our six determinants and the augmentation there. So we we'll say seven for our supply curve and our six for our demand curve. So write these down, work through them, say, okay, hey, here's my one. Which one does this kind of best fit into? And work through it as we had here. Hopefully this video really helps me like, clarify how we work through these comparative statics. If there are any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me, post to that D2L frequently asked questions or through email.